Hello, my name is Paul O'Byrne of O'Byrne & Kennedy LLP, a firm of chartered accountants and business and specialists in Goffsoak, Hertfordshire in England, United Kingdom, England. Um, I just wanted to drop in and say a few words really about our firm and tell you a little bit about our history so that you can understand the context of some of the things that we do here. Um, we started off very much as a, an ordinary firm. We started in 1987 and I was a partner in another firm, Paul Kennedy, had just qualified as a chartered accountant and rather than stay on, we started a new business. What did we start? An accounting practice. Yes, we did. What great imagination. And with even more imagination, we called it O'Byrne and Kennedy. Fantastic. Uh, we've shown a little bit more thought since then, but in those early days, we um, had a great start to our careers. I think many people do. We had very low costs when we first started because we started out in the back room of my house. And we had some clients already, so we hit the ground running. And when we did our work, we actually had time for our clients. But fortunately for us, unfortunately for them, we got busy. And so through the 90s, we were busy chasing um, lots of work, building our client base, until we got to the stage in 1997 that we had nearly 500 clients and we had an average fee of nearly £1,000. So we were doing half a million pounds worth of turnover. And that was, we were doing quite well on that, I have to say. Um, but we had a few things that happened that were fairly dramatic and we, we thought about our business and we thought about the, what we wanted for our business and was it doing what we wanted. And we all come to these things, don't we? I happen when my birthdays have got a naught on the end for some reason. So when I was 40, I started to reflect and think about what I wanted to do with my life and career. And we decided that we enjoyed very much doing the type of work that was advisory where clients really appreciated it that seemed to be a lot less price sensitive i have to say and looking ahead we wondered where the firm where the future of the profession was going because audits were increasingly seen as of no value i'm not saying they weren't but they were seen as that and i think we in the council profession did ourselves a lot of harm by treating it as a commodity you, you know you're getting zero bids for an audit because then the firm would get the other work and i think putting a price of nothing on an audit conveys something about its value so we decided that we wanted to change the way we were doing and we had, when we first started, a lot of experience and a lot of good experiences with advising people. We thought we were good at that and we developed some consulting protocols, but we realised that we weren't getting anywhere. We needed to reskill somewhat and redirect our efforts, but it's so hard when you're busy all the time. So we took a, a big, bold decision that um, essentially what we did was we thought about it and we, did the, we said, what if, a great consulting tool, what if? And we said, what if instead of having 500 clients, we had 50 clients? Now, if we had 50 clients paying us the average fee of £1,000, we'd starve, that's what if. But of course, we were thinking, what if we could have 50 clients and still have a turnover of 500000 that means the average fee would be £10,000. Now, for a small firm, we were seven or eight people at the time. That was, oh, you know, £10,000 fee. You can do something for that. That's a budget within which you can do some work. You can go and see them weekly, if it comes to it, and spend some time with them. And we all think that we can do this advisory work, and we think if only we had more time and the clients wanted it. The clients do want it, and we've got as much time as there is. It's how we spend our time, which is important, isn't it? So we did it, and in fact what we did was, we, we, uh, I can explain in more detail about how we did this, but the fact is we sacked over 300 clients over the next three years, and that was quite a hard process, and like I say, that, that's something that perhaps we could go into in more detail some other time. Uh, we presently here, so this is uh, early 2005, presently here we have 74 clients, at an average fee of something over £8,000. So our turnover hasn't gone up very much, but you know what, our costs have gone down a lot, we don't have a lot of storage, and the value we create is absolutely tremendous. And we now feel something like, my partner Paul Kennedy was saying just the other day, he says it, we're almost like a startup. We've not got that many clients, but we've got things in place, we've got energy and enthusiasm and capacity to move forward. And if we move that, those client numbers from 74 we aim to do to 100, over the next three years, and increase our average free from 8,000 to over 10,000, then we'll feel we'll do very well indeed. And that's what we want to do. Now, part of the way we've done this is by transitioning from being what I think of as a firm of the past to what Ron Baker certainly would call a firm of the future. And this means that we've had to get over quite a few things. 
we've had to get over the idea that not every customer is a good customer. So customer selection is a major issue, clearly, and customer deselection is a major issue and a major task, I have to tell you, because you've got to do it professionally and appropriately, and it, it, it's time-consuming, but well worth it, I promise you. You've got to get over the idea that the people that work for you are drones that you put to work and get working for you. These people are knowledge workers, and as Peter Drucker would say, Ron told me, because I've never heard him say this, Peter Drucker says that knowledge workers are volunteers. Now, I'm not saying we don't have to pay them. We do. Uh, in fact, we pay them quite well, we think. But they are volunteers in as much as they're in demand. Whether they come back tomorrow or not, that's kind of up to them, isn't it? Not, I know they've got to give notice and things, and if they're listening, I don't want them to think they can just go. But they have to suit themselves. They can suit themselves. They actually own the means of production. They've got the knowledge in their heads. They drive off in their cars 5.30 every night. Whether they come back the next day, it's kind of up to them. So we have to change our attitude towards the people that work for us, the good people, the ones we really want. They're knowledge workers. And the other thing is, we've got to recognise what do we sell. We do not sell time or at least none of our clients buy time. They don't want our time. They really don't care how long you take over doing their accounts or whatever. They care about results, not efforts. They care about outputs, not inputs. And we have to get over that. So when you look at uh, Ron Baker's writing about the firm of the future, and you look at that new practice equation, and you think it's not about people power times productivity times an hourly rate and when you think about leveraging the effectiveness of people when you think about making sure that you're leveraging intellectual capital in, in the forms that he lays it out the human capital the, the things that leave every night the structural capital the stuff that's left when they go home so your systems and processes and i'm sure you've got lots of those not just thinking about the computers but the internet and the procedures that type of thing and the social capital, the relationship capital, as we sometimes call it, which is the relationships you've got with your clients and the relationships, indeed, you've got with referral sources and alumni and all those type of people. And then you leverage that with price. Then you can really start to make a difference because it's a completely different paradigm. I know it's a much used phrase, but the paradigm is entirely different. And in our transition, since we first met Ron Baker in March 2004, the difference in our lives has been absolutely extraordinary. And I believe that it's hard to convey this by just by reading the book or something. So I, I'd love to be able to explain to you in more detail about the way it's actually got into our culture. But the important thing is that in recognising that new practice equation, and I think intellectually we all understand that the world has changed, certainly the world has changed, we understand that. But emotionally, buying into it so that we make the change, that, that's a challenge. And that's why I think it's useful to perhaps give you some stories and anecdotes about how we've done that. So we'd like to do that in more detail because ultimately, as we all know, the world doesn't owe us a living. It doesn't owe, owe the profession a living. And I don't care what monopolies we've benefited from in the past or indeed are going to benefit from in the future. We've got to create value outside of ourselves. If we don't create value outside, there's no customers going to pay us what we want. We're not going to get enough of what we want. There's no one going to want to go come and work for us if we don't give them more of what we want. We go around and talk to other accountants and indeed other lawyers and other professional uh, service firms, knowledge workers, and they all complain about the same things, about succession, about you can't get good people, you can't keep good people, you have to pay you good people, all of these things. Actually, if you address the, your mind to the firm, thinking about it as set out in the firm of the future, you'll see the answers are there. You might not like the answers, I've got to tell you, but the answer's are there, and you can make that difference. You can start to make those changes. You can start to look at the way you price. You can start the way to look at you sell your services. You can look at the services themselves, and are they all that they should be? Do they give value to your clients? Are the clients the ones that you want? Are you going to have to let some go to free up capacity to serve the good ones? And of course, are you going to have to trash time sheets? We thought that was a big challenge when Ron explained all that to us and you've got to do this trashing timesheets. We said, OK, we believe all the other stuff, but Ron, trashing timesheets, don't see why you shouldn't keep them. We now realise we've come through the other end. We've been three years now without timesheets, nearly three years. And I can't tell you what a difference it's made to us. Firstly, you can run a firm without timesheets, quite, quite obviously. But it's where your attention goes when you stop looking at the time. 
Where does it go? It goes on what we do, how we do it, who does it, and what the clients get from it. And that's got to be good for your future.